Hi, I'm Ali Skreiner. I am from Ultragenics Pharmaceutical, and I am the head of our clinical outcomes research and evaluation group. Uh, we have a group of 10 people now who are dedicated to the design of clinical trials and the development and validation of endpoints. So I'm happy to be here today to tell you a little bit about what we do and a recent experience that we've had with FDA for the development of Burosumab, which was approved by FDA um, in April of this year and is marketed as Crisvita. Crisvita. Is that how you like it? I never get it quite right. So we use a dynamic development approach um, to our trials, and I want to highlight some of the strategies that we use within the company and how we were able to leverage these to engage in what became a very collaborative effort with DBRUB to advance the development of Burosumab for XLH. And so, as I mentioned before, we did get FDA approval, um, but some of these strategies that I'm gonna talk about today uh, led us to get breakthrough designation in June of 2016 uh, using a preliminary look at, at our data set before the trial was complete. And then in June of 2017, we had a pre-BLA meeting where we were granted permission to file for approval on the basis of the totality of the data that we had collected in children and adults um, without fully completing our phase three pediatric study, which had an active comparator group. That study is now complete. Um, but my focus today is how we use these strategies to maximize the data that we had collected from that first study to advance the development, specifically getting breakthrough designation and getting permission um, to file prior to the completion um, of the phase three pediatric. So a little bit about XLH, it's a lifelong and progressive disorder of phosphate metabolism. It causes chronic hypophosphatemia. That chronic hypophosphatemia uh, manifests as rickets, delayed growth, and lower extremity deformity in children. Um, it does not resolve, it's lifelong, so it progresses in adults. They suffer complications from unresolved childhood disease as well as progressive osteomalacia which leads to frequent poorly healed fractures, particularly in the lower extremity. Osteoarthritis from misalignment of the joints that was not corrected and calcification of tendons and ligaments, so anthesopathy as well as spinal stenosis. Pain and disability across the lifespan are common in the disease. Almost all children are treated with a regimen of multiple daily doses of phosphate and calcitriol. This is a complex regimen that requires careful monitoring. Um, efficacy is limited, but it's enough that it makes a placebo-controlled trial in these children unethical to do, particularly in the early stages of clinical investigation. So one of the things that's a hallmark um, of, of my group um, within the organization is I feel it's imperative to start learning about the disease from the patient perspective before starting the trials. And so we did something as simple as an online survey uh, with pediatric caregivers and adults with XLH to get some insight into their clinical presentation and the impact of the disease on their daily lives. We collected data in over 200 adults and 100 children with the disease and created a summary report that was provided to FDA as part of our BTD application. And I think that this simple survey gave us tremendous insight that we could use not only internally to design the trial and, and select the endpoints, but also I think um, provided insight to the agency. It, it showed our commitment to understand the disease. I also think it was an education tool um, for them, so that we were all on the same page about the patient population that we were dealing with. We learned that pain and gross motor impairment and mobility restrictions were common in children and adults, secondary to the rickets and the leg deformity in the children, but also the osteomalacia and fractures. So um, this really allowed us to select our endpoints. For the pediatric trials, we knew um, that we needed to see changes in bone health, but we felt that we could supplement that with information on walking ability, gross motor function, and a PRO called the POSNA pod C. Um, and that is a PRO that was developed by the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America. For the adults, the survey told us that pain was such a significant issue. We chose uh, the BPI question three, so pain at its worst in the last 24 hours, as well as the stiffness and physical function domains of the WOMAC as key secondary endpoints.
In addition to allowing us to select these endpoints, we also realized about the heterogeneity of the pain response. All of the patients had pain of varying degrees. Um, almost all of it was in the moderate to severe range. So not only did we require that the patients have pain as part of the enrollment, we actually, based on the survey results, knew how to stratify um, our sample to ensure that we had a good distribution um, of baseline pain. And this just goes to, um, you know, it just reflects, these are very simple, uh, very, very simple survey, but it shows you how significant stiffness, uh, gait disturbance, and pain are for children and adults. And so from in the clinic, what looks like a very different clinical presentation is actually having the same impact in terms of the patient perception of treatment. Another thing that we do within my group is develop and validate disease-specific measures. I think it's very important in rare disease, but it's also daunting, certainly intimidating, to develop a disease-specific measure. But where we have such small groups of heterogeneous patients, I think it gives us all a comfort level that we are you know, answering the question of the clinical meaningfulness and the clinical response. Um, of any intervention that we we're engaging in. And so for XLH, we developed disease-specific radiograph disease specific radiographic global impression of change scale um, for use in XLH. And we also validated an existing scale, the Thatcher Ricketts Severity Score, which was developed for nutritional rickets, but we validated it for XLH. And we actually embarked on the development of the RGIC at the recommendation of Dr. Thatcher, who had developed the Ricketts Severity Score for nutritional rickets. And the reason why he did this is because we had um, the added issue or challenge that all of our patients were coming to us having been treated with a suboptimal regimen, but one that had just enough efficacy that it was altering our baseline read of the clinical presentation of the disease. So we developed this measure in a way that we could supplement what we had chosen to be the primary endpoint, which was the Ricketts severity score, and ultimately in that phase three pediatric study with an active comparator group, we ended up using the RGIC as the primary endpoint because the validation had been completed. So with the RGIC, the raters are usually pediatric radiologists who rate a disease-specific list of radiographic abnormalities using pre versus post images, so it's a side-by-side -side comparison. They rate change in these individual abnormalities, and then they assign a regional change score for the wrist, the knee, and the leg, as well as an overall impression score. And so we convened an expert panel to come up with the abnormalities, and then the, once we had provided that list, we gave it to our central imaging facility who conducted an elaborate rater training to make sure that we had consensus on the nomenclature, the appearance of the abnormality, and the severity of the abnormality. And the reason why I emphasize, emphasize the third party is it allowed us to maintain a distance between us and the raters who were actually um, performing. And that was very important because this was an open label study. So we wanted to make sure that we did not have any influence on the raters themselves and that they had very limited knowledge about the trial that we were conducting. We established the intra and inter rater reliability of both the RSS and the RJC, and we also showed the relationship between baseline scores and biochemical measures, as well as change in biochemical and clinical measures that matched the response that we saw on the RSS scores and the RJC. So just in brief, you can see the baseline scores were always on the left, the post-treatment image was on the right. The rater would evaluate whether the, the abnormality was present um, in the baseline and whether or not it was better, worse, or unchanged at week 40. And uh, to complement what Dr. Kakis was saying, you know, this helped us address the heterogeneity because a patient was not penalized for not having the abnormality at baseline. We were only interested in what abnormalities were present, not how many, and whether or not they were changed after 40 weeks of treatment. Another strategy um, that we used, we actually had several to help us to adjust for the lack of the placebo arm in that first pediatric study. We did do a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in adults, so I'm only referring to the first pediatric study 
We mined a database that had been collected by an XLH expert over the last 30 years to, and these were all patients that were treated with that conventional therapy regimen that I had mentioned. And we evaluated and mined radiographic growth and biochemical data from that database to evaluate for potential use as a comparator group. So we were able to get data from over 100 children who were between the ages of 5 and 14. And because they were managed by an XLH expert, this gave us some sort of uh, comfort that this is the best that that conventional therapy regimen could do, because these patients were managed um, as, as well as they could be. Uh, we also really focus on the use of objective endpoints when you cannot um, conduct a placebo-controlled trial, because this gives you a, the ability to use a patient's own data as their control data. We had radiographs of growth for children, so it's, it's hard to have any kind of impact on an on a endpoint like that, and bio, biopsies for uh, the adults. We were always looking at the patient's response in relation to not only their baseline time point, but their historical data. And finally, we used blinding exercises that allowed us to enhance the robustness of the data that was collected in an open label setting. So the raters that we used for our radiographic ratings, as well as the raters that we used for the biopsies in adults, were blinded to the subject ID, their gender, um, their age, and their treatment status. And this data that we collected from the Natural History Survey uh, was used to further blind the raters because we mixed those x-ray pairs in with our treatment x-ray pairs. So even if they were aware of the protocol that we were conducting, they still wouldn't know if they were looking at a, treated, a patient that was treated with berosumab or one that was treated with conventional therapy. And again, all of this was designed to allow us to create a comparator group and not have to wait until the results read out of our phase three study. Another thing that we focus on is maximizing the subject history to evaluate an individual treatment response. I know it, it sounds um, very basic, but I have found in my 20 years of uh, rare disease experience that the amount of data that is collected from medical and surgical history, even within clinical trials, is just terrible. And it's because these patients are receiving multidisciplinary care, so there's many different physicians involved. And because they've had the disease their whole lives, there are many things that are classic hallmarks of the disease that don't even get filled in as part of the medical history because it's just been there and it's been there the entire time. So the medical histories actually read like physical exams and they only show new abnormalities or new symptoms and conditions. So we have gone and taken a very um, proactive approach to collecting medical and surgical history. And this gave us a lot of information. So when we did our surveys and we did our screenings, we found that subjects who had any history of fracture had more pain and impairment at screening. And then we found that subjects, when they actually had a re treatment response and healed fractures, had much better response um, in terms of reduction in pain. So getting all of that history on what patients experienced prior to enrollment in the study was critical. We did the same thing with the x-rays from our pediatric trial subjects. So in addition to mining that natural history database, we collected up to three years of x-rays prior to study enrollment so that we could see how each patient was doing on conventional therapy prior to enrolling in our study. And essentially what this allowed us to do was to show that the patients were not waxing and waning in terms of their bone health, that they were getting the best that conventional therapy could do for them, and they still had a significant amount of radiographic abnormality. And then finally, we looked at all the growth data from pediatric subjects back to birth, if we could, so that we could evaluate growth velocity prior to enrollment and allow us to compare their rate of growth prior to enrollment in the study and after. And what we're learning now is that growth velocity z-scores are really helpful, especially when you're trying to evaluate growth in a shorter duration trial. And then the most important thing that I think um, that we did in this program is modify our trial based on preliminary analyses. Uh, I know historically this has given people pause, but I think that it allowed us to get it right the first time. And I think if we are going to try to hit it out of the ballpark the very first, with the very first trial, we have to be very thoughtful in how we do it.
our preliminary data from the first cohort of children was evaluated to make sure we had the right trial design, that we were on the right track with the dosing. Because this was the first time that this monoclonal antibody had been put into children, we started the dose very low. Um, and then we titrated um, up. And so the original protocol allowed only for the enrollment of subjects who had rickets or deformity. But what we found is in those 40 weeks results that I had shown you before, we saw a near complete healing in rickets at, um, after 40 weeks. And so this told us that if we were going to uh, maximize our chances of hitting our primary endpoint in the study, we could amend the protocol and expand and enrich the study population for rickets. We also learned when we looked at the full 40 weeks of data from the cohort that we were, had superiority of the Q2 to Q4 dosing regimen, and that led us to make a change at week 64 that allowed all patients to transition to the Q2 dosing. And this data was submitted in our BTD application as well. And so from this graph, you can see the rapid change um, based on the abnormalities depicted in the red arrows, the rapid change that we saw in 40 weeks in terms of the radiographic abnormalities. And in the bottom graph that we were able to show with the Q2 dosing that we could restore phosphate to the normal level and maintain it as opposed to having patients go back down to their baseline between doses. And so this meant that we were able to keep the children in a therapeutic range um, between dosing. We also followed the agency guidance to validate our PROs um, to support the endpoints that we saw. It was a standard val validation approach that's outlined in the guidance, so I won't spend um, too much time um, on that. But I did want to emphasize that performing a full validation um, in accordance with the guidance is uh, time consuming, so it definitely needs to start earlier in the process. And then finally, um, what we have at Ultragenics is a disease monitoring program. We've initiated this program um, to honor our post-marketing commitment to study long-term safety and efficacy in patients who are treated with borosumab, but also we're looking at disease burden in patients who are not treated with borosumab. And so our goal is to enroll 500 children and adults with XLH over the next 10 years and again, not only to evaluate the long-term safety and efficacy of the drug and those who are transitioning to drug post-approval, but also to look at those, those untreated populations. And we're going to have up to 35 sites in the U.S., Canada, and Latin America. And we feel strongly that a program like this is going to give us more insight into disease progression and treatment outcomes than you would see in a traditional long-term extension study like we're used to doing, where the groups are much smaller. So in summary, I think it's very important um, to design survey studies and start developing endpoints prior to the IND filing, and that disease-specific endpoints, if you're willing to take on the work of doing it, can be really critical and very informative. Um, leveraging historical data, selecting, selecting objective endpoints, and being very rigorous in your rating techniques can help if you're not able to do a placebo-controlled trial. Early learn studies should be able to allow for adjustments to maximize the use of subject data and investing in a comprehensive um, strategic program to evaluate long-term outcomes can help us answer questions that can't be answered in a clinical trial and allow us to do shorter trials so that we can get drugs to patients quicker. Um, the clinical development model um, that I've outlined with you and the collaborative um, role that the FDA played with us, it's, it's an example of a success, um, but most companies don't have groups of 10 people who are dedicated to doing this in every program that's in their pipeline. So I do feel that having a dedicated center of excellence for rare disease that could help facilitate the implementation of some of the strategies um, that I've outlined to you could really improve the model and accelerate drug development. Thank you. And all of our, our, our pediatric study was published in the New England Journal, and our adult study um, was recently published in JBMR. And then we also do publish all of our um, outcomes initiatives, and uh, so all of the information on how we develop and validate endpoints is available. Any questions Thanks. or comments? All right, thank you.